one of the most important tools that we have in the workshop and one that we just about use every day. With these tools, we need to be very confident that we're getting the result from these tools that we know we should. So you may be looking at the range of hand planes that I have on the workbench here and thinking that the majority of them, well these four anyway, are record planes which are at the low end of the hand plane market. These are some of the cheaper hand planes that you can find. And you may also be thinking that if Scott is using the cheaper hand planes, how can he get the result that he knows that he would surely get if he were using a more expensive hand plane? Maybe one like a, a Lee Nilsson or a Holti hand plane. Well, certainly with a Lee Nilsson or a Holti, when you buy your hand plane and you take it out of the box, it's ready to go. These ones do need a little bit of work, but if you're prepared to spend two or three hours on your hand plane to true it up, you will have it working as sweetly as any of those more expensive planes. I just want to run through some of the planes that I've got here on the workbench. This is a low angle block plane. Um, I really only use this occasionally for end grain, but more for arising edges. This is a smoothing plane that I have tweaked and spent some time on and I must admit I don't really use this very much. This is my bench plane or jack plane, it's a five and a half. This is the plane that I use for most of my work. And this big one here, the jointer number seven, is one that I've just purchased. It's very cheap, it's $160 Australian. And in the second part of this DVD, we're going to spend some time on this plane and we're going to get it working as if it were a far more expensive one and have it working very sweetly, but for a fraction of the cost. This is a shoulder plane. This one really is just used for rebating primarily, cutting into shoulders. And this one is a scraper plane which is used for grain that may be interlocking or a little bit more difficult to plane truly just with a, a normal bench plane. If in some circumstances you need to plane against the grain, then this is the one as well. In the first part of this DVD, we're gonna be concentrating on plane blades. And in the second one as mentioned, we're gonna concentrate on fixing up a brand new plane. I have some new blades that I've bought, which are fresh out of the box. These are from Lee Nielsen Toolworks. These blades are the new A2 cryogenically treated steel, which is much harder than normal English steel. It's marketed as holding its edge for up to five times longer than English steel. And I have been using these blades for about 12 months. It's fantastic. These blades do hold their edge longer, which means less sharpening, more time to work. It's a fantastic thing. I'm very happy with these blades. So here I have a new one for the bench planes and a new one for the block plane. I'm going to show you how to prepare these blades, how to sharpen them to a razor sharp edge, and then how to resharpen. Before I move over to my sharpening station and show you how to start preparing and sharpening blades, I'm just going to talk a little bit about the blades themselves. When I'm using my bench planes, I have tried using the blades with both a perfectly straight edge and a very slightly curved edge. And when I say curved, I mean just these two edges just falling away slightly so that there's a very slight radius on the blade. And what I found is that when I'm planing up a piece of wood, when I used the blade that had a perfectly straight edge, I was left with tracks in the wood, which I really didn't like. 
it forced me to use sandpaper to get rid of these tracks. When I have a very slight radius or curve on this blade, because the blade then falls away into the sole of the plane, I don't have to use sandpaper. The tracks aren't there. It's, it's a very clean, smooth result. So when I'm sharpening these blades, I'm going to show you how to sharpen them and just have a very slight curve. Uh, it's something that I know a lot of the makers use and it is a very good thing, very effective to do. Of course, when we're using something like a shoulder plane and we're cutting tight into a right angle corner, we don't want a curved blade on our shoulder plane. That will be perfectly straight. If you are using your bench plane to shoot and you have your plane on its side and you are shooting up against a side, there may be call for you to just have a straight blade in your plane. I haven't found it particularly necessary. The radius is so small that when I'm shooting, I know exactly the size of the board that I'm shooting and I can set my blade so that I'm cutting that very cleanly. And I've found that I really don't need to have a straight blade when I'm shooting. But in saying that, there are times when you need a straight blade, so just be wary of the result you're trying to achieve and sharpen your blade accordingly. So in summing up, what we need for our hand plane to work as sweetly as we know it should is for this tool to have a very flat sole, for the blade to be razor sharp and for the chip breaker to fit very snugly and tightly along the front edge of the blade so that the shavings will flow out very smoothly. Once we have all that in place and everything else is right, then we're well on our way to taking some beautiful shavings and having the result that we know we should get. All right, let's get started. Okay, this is my sharpening station. This is everything that I need to prepare blades and sharpen blades. And I'm just going to go through quickly what I've got here and we'll cover them all in greater depth when we're doing the job. I have two Japanese water stones in the pond here. One is an 800 grit stone and the other is a 1200 grit stone. I also have a polishing stone here, Japanese water stone which is a 6,000. You could use an 8,000. I find that this 6,000 is adequate for what I'm doing. Once this is worn out, I will upgrade to, a, to an 8,000. Coming with that stone is the chalky block, the Nagura, which is used to create the slurry on this stone. I have some 180 grit wet and dry sandpaper, which I use to ensure the stones are always flat. I have a couple of laminated pieces of thin paper to help me get a curved blade. These are a quarter of a mil thick. I've got a honing guide, which some people like and some people don't. I think it's great. We're gonna be using one of these. I have a Tormek whetstone grinder and the various attachments that come with it. This one, which holds the blade and slides onto the rod. And this is the new truing tool which enables you to true the stone very accurately when it has worn. A bottle with water that I can spray, a screwdriver, and that's about it. That's about all we need. Before we get started on preparing the backs of the blades and going through what we need to do, I just want to talk to you a little bit about sharpness and what we're trying to achieve. When you buy these blades, you will see on the back they do look very polished and very shiny. But if you look closely, you can also see the coarse manufacturer scratches in the back of this blade. When we're striving for a razor sharp edge, 
The way we achieve that is through the meeting point of two polished surfaces. If we only have the bevel polished and we do nothing to the back, we have a nice polished sharp surface meeting a surface that is quite coarse and rough. It's not ideal. If we also polish up the back, then where the two points meet, both of them will be polished and we will have a very sharp blade indeed. That's what we're striving to achieve. So what we need to do first is to polish and flatten the back of the blade and to remove all of the coarse manufacturer's scratches. We don't need to do the whole back. We're really just concentrating on this section here, but mostly we're concentrating right on the edge. I'm going to show you some tricks to save time and how we can get this done reasonably quickly. It's a one-off job. When you get a new blade, the first thing you do is polish the back and you do it once, that's it. From there on in, all you're concerned about is the bevel. So we do have a bit of time to spend on a new blade, but once it's done, it's done. With the Japanese water stones that I use, the 800 grit stone is used initially to commence polishing of the back surface and it is also used to hone the initial bevel. We'll be doing all of these in depth. This 1200 grit stone is solely used for polishing the back. I don't use it on the bevel at all. And the fine 6000 grit stone is used for the final polishing on the back and for the final bevel. I thought uh, I should tell you a bit about these Japanese water stones. Um, so I printed something off the net, which I'm just going to read to you, which explains very quickly about these stones. With the coarse water stones, it says, our water stones are manufactured from a variety of fused abrasives, which create a porous, friable surface. This is important since as the tool is rubbed on the stone, the particles of abrasive are rounded and dulled. Unfortunately, with oil stones, the particles are tightly bound together, producing a dulled surface, which greatly reduces cutting speed. On the other hand, the water stone's porous, friable surface keeps fresh, sharp abrasive constantly exposed on the surface, thus accelerating and optimising the cutting effect. With the, the finishing stone in the Nagura, it says about the Nagura that it is a small synthetic stone that is rubbed on the surface of finishing po and polishing stones to create a paste. It is this paste that lubricates and creates the polishing action of our finishing and polishing stones. They will greatly improve the cutting effect of all synthetic stones. So there you go. That's a little bit about what these stones do. We're going to start now with preparing the back. And the first thing that we're going to do is ensure that the surface of our first coarse stone, the 800 grit, is flat and true because we want to have a true flat surface to commence the polishing of the back of the blade because we want the back of the blade to be flat and true. We don't want bumps, we want it to be flat. Okay, first of all, I'm just going to break the back of this sandpaper so I can get it to stick very nicely on this float glass. So I'm just going to roll it over these edges. So that it will sit nice and flat. If you spray water onto the float glass, that surface tension will keep it nice and firm. So we'll spray a bit there and I'll also just spray a bit on the back of the paper itself. And we will stick that down nice and flat. Shouldn't move too much. Okay, we take the 800 grit stone out of the pond. Now, before I do anything, to help me determine whether or not it's flat, I'm going to draw a pencil grid so that I can see how uniformly the pencil is removed. So I'm just going to run a few lines 
pencil lines down this, like such, and across. Okay, so you can see what I've done there. I've got pencil lines going, going vertically and horizontally. Now, all I'm going to do is just rub this on the way you like. Just lift it up quickly. You will be able to see how quickly these are being removed, whether they're being removed uniformly or not. And it will tell you how flat the stone is and when you get it flat. It goes a nice pink colour. Most of it has gone down this side and there's a little bit left pencil line here and here. So I just need to do a little bit more to get it flat. There's still a little bit of pencil line up here, so I'm just going to do a little bit more. So these stones cut steel quite quickly, but they also lose their shape quite quickly. So that's why you just need to ensure that they're flat. But flattening them does not take long. I've just wet that down in the pond. It's a beautiful pink surface. It's lovely and clean. It's flat. When you are flattening these, you can remove these edges and make them a little bit sharp. So it's a good idea just to replace those bevels that you remove. It's as easy as that. So now we are ready to start preparing the back of the blade. As I mentioned before, we're really only concerned about an inch and a half, this area here on the back of the blade, and primarily concerned with the bevel. You don't need to polish the whole lot. Now when you look at your blade initially, it's quite shiny. And after you have started to polish the back on the 800 grit water stone, it may look a little bit cloudy. Don't think you've wrecked your blade, you're improving it. So don't get worried about the change in appearance of the blade. Okay, now there's really only a couple of movements that we are able to do on these stones because of their shape. But the first one is basically we're going to be pulling this backwards and forwards along the length of the stone. We're going to start with it hanging out about five mil and we're going to allow it eventually to creep on about a third of the stone which is about 15 mil okay so we need to hold it very firm because we do not want to rock this blade we want to keep it very flat on the stone we will see the stone change appearance and after maybe two or three minutes we will need to reflatten this stone so let's have a go hold it very firm Use your fingers. I use my fingers here as a guide as well, these ones. And I'm going to just run it down like this. Just initially, just like that. Plenty of pressure. And then allow it to creep onto the stone. And then back off and just keep doing this. You might be able to see that areas of the stone are starting to look a bit grey or dark and that is the particles of steel that are being removed from the back of the blade. We really need to be conscious of, the, of how out of shape we're putting the, the stone. as we need to keep it flat. I'm just going to do this for maybe another minute.
Okay. I'm going to give it a sponge down. And just wipe it with a cloth. And then let's have a look at it. You can see that the back of this blade has started to go quite grey and matte. But if you look closely, you can also see that some of the manufacturer's scratches have to be removed. It's a little bit difficult for to show you this due to the glare on the blade, but uh, you will be able to see this for yourself. I can see that this stone is getting dark. So I'm just going to turn this around and go from the other side and do a bit more. Have a look. Okay, I can see that the coarse manufacturer's scratches are starting to be removed and be replaced with the coarse scratches from this 800 grit stone. Now, I'm going to do this for maybe five minutes. I'm going to just check the flatness of this stone now before I proceed. So I'm going to wet this down, take all that slurry off in the trough. I'm going to replace the pencil grid Now, once again, back onto the 180 grit wet and dry. I'm going to give it a couple of rubs and then have a look at it. Okay, so I can see that I've removed the pencil line up here and up here. So these are the high parts. These low bits are where the pencil still remains. So let's just Flatten it out. Sometimes it might seem time consuming and it might seem a little bit pedantic the way we go about this, but it's a one-off job and if you do it right, it will be very beneficial for you in your hand planing. Okay, that's removed all of the pencil. I'm just going to wash this in the pond. And take all that off. So that stone has now been reflattened and it's ready to go again. Now the other movement that you can do on these stones to help flatten and polish the back is rather than going up and down the length of the stone, you can come across ways like this. It helps to balance out the scratches balance out the, the cutting and keep it nice and flat. Once again, you don't want to be tilting it. You want it to creep on about a third so you've got plenty of blade to keep nice and flat and then just push it back off to the side. So let's just go. That's all we're doing. Plenty of pressure. Move it down the stone. I'm not too worried about the rocking that I'm doing as long as I'm keeping it flat. You can see the colour that is appearing on this stone down this side, the particles of steel. 
just going to turn it around and I'm going to do the same from the other side. You do need plenty of pressure. And I'm not going to do too much more because the stone's gone quite dark. Now if I have a good, really good look at this blade, it's starting to look quite nice. I can see the pattern of the scratches from this coarse stone. Now, I'm going to do this, both of these motions, lengthways and crossways, probably for about another 10 minutes and then I will be ready to change to the 1200 grit stone and remove the scratches created from this 800 grit. Okay, I've continued to do that on the 800 grit stone for about another five minutes and I can see that the coarse manufacturer's scratches have been replaced by scratches from the 800 grit stone. Now I have taken the 1200 grit stone out and I flattened that using the pencil grid as well. Now I'm going to do the same movements on this 1200 grit stone. The difference between the two stones doesn't sound like much, especially when you jump to a 6000 or an 8000 for the polishing stone, but the finish that you get off the 1200 grit stone is far superior to the 800. So now I'm just going to do the same movements again, this time on the 1200 grit stone. Same amount of pressure. Resist the temptation to go too long. That's starting to look very nice. I'm going to do the other side. I think that'll do. Stone's starting to look a bit messy. So I'm going to remove all of the slurry off this stone and then once again I'm going to put a pencil grid on it and I'm going to flatten it on 180 grit wet and dry. Okay so in summing up what I've just done I basically spent between five and ten minutes polishing the back with the 800 grit stone and then using the same movements down the stone and across the stone I spent about five minutes on the 1200 grit stone. So now the back of the blade is looking quite good and quite polished. Now we come to the 6000 grit stone to achieve that final nice shiny polish. Now it would be quite tedious for me to try and do the whole of this back as I've done with the other two stones on the 6000 and persevere until I do get that mirror finish. So there's a little trick that David Charlesworth showed me in his workshop and he calls it the ruler trick. And all it is, is we're going to, this is a thin steel rule, it's 0.5 of a millimetre thick, we're going to place it down one side of the stone like that, fix it with the slurry, 
and then we're going to take the blade and put it across the side like this and pull it on and off the stone. You will see that by placing a 0.5mm ruler down one side, it is enabling us through creating that small pitch to just concentrate on the end bevel of this blade. That will save us a lot of time. We can't do this with chisels. We need chisels to be perfectly flat on the whole of the sole. With a plain, plain blade, we can get away with it. <laughs> so, the ruler trick, the final polishing method. I'm going to spray some water on the 6000 grit stone and a little bit on the Nagura and then we create a paste, a slurry. I find that where I live in the southwest of Western Australia, especially at this time of the year, which is summertime, it's very warm and it's very dry. There's very little humidity in the air. So I find that the Nagura dries out very quickly and so does the slurry that it creates on the polishing surface of this stone. You can see that dry patch in the middle right there already. So it's best to not have it too sloppy, but I find that I need, it to, need to have it sloppy, otherwise it dries out too quickly. Now the paste will enable this ruler to sit there quite nicely. Then now I'm going to take the blade and I'm just going to rest it across the side, keep good pressure and just draw it on and then just push it backwards and forwards, you can move it down the stone and this is just polishing the tip of the end. It's going to give us a lovely polished mirror surface. Let's have a look. Maybe you can just see down the bottom of that blade how it looks a little bit more polished than the rest. Going to do a little bit more. And that's about it. That's good enough for the time being. So we'll go with that. We now come to the part where we're concentrating solely on the bevel. On my plane blades and my chisels, I have three bevels. There's the initial bevel, which is already on the tool when it comes. For example, on this plane blade, there's the initial bevel, which has been ground at 25 degrees. I then place a secondary bevel at a slightly steeper angle using the 800 grit water stone, the coarse stone, and then a micro bevel at a slightly higher angle again, and that's on the 6000 grit stone. On my wall here, I have a list of the various tools that I use, chisels as in pairing, striking, mortise chisels. Plane blades, I have bench planes, block planes and shoulder planes. And on this little chart, I have grinding angles for the Tormek, the coarse stone and the fine stone. I have the angles that I like to use and the projection. How far out from the honing guide or, or in this particular instance, this jig that's used on the Tormek how many millimetres I need to have it protruding out to get the angle that I want. So I know the angles and I know the projections. I'm not muck mucking around. I know exactly what I need to do every time I come to sharpen. I use this Tormek whetstone grinder to place the primary bevel, which is here already at 25 degrees. This enables me to produce a wire edge reasonably quickly on the coarse stones and the fine stones and I'll find that I can resharpen four, five, sometimes six times 
before it, it's really taking me quite a while to produce that wire edge. Every time you resharpen on the stones, you're actually increasing the height of that bevel. So it's going to take you a little bit longer to produce a wire edge every time. When I find that it's taking me too long and it's getting a bit boring, I will then come to the whetstone grinder and I will re-grind out both the, the primary bevel and the secondary bevel just to the edge of the initial bevel. If I take it right to the edge and plane it down, I'm probably shortening the life of this blade. Just leaving a sliver of the initial bevel is fine. Then I go back to the water stones and it's very quick to produce a wire edge. When I've got a brand new blade that I've never used before, I like to hone the bevel on the grinder before I do it on the water stones. So that's what we're going to do now. We're going to use this Torment grinder and we're going to just hone the initial bevel. Although it's there, we're just going to clean it up anyway. So I have set my blade in the jig to give me an angle of 35, uh, sorry, 25 degrees. One thing that I will talk about with this grinder before I go any further is Tormek have actually put out a new truing tool, the TT50, which is much better than the old one. Um, it does it by itself. All you need to do is wind it through. You can't possibly change the angles with your fingers and it will take it very smooth and very square. But when I'm truing this, I need to uh, adjust the height of this bar. Now, this bar is set so that it's a specific distance away from the wheel and all of my angles run off those, that setting. So I just have here a very simple block. It's three, three mil bits of ply glued together to give me a nine mil bit of ply. When I am going to reset this bar, I just place this on the wheel and I take the bar down until it fits very snugly and firmly on that rod, tighten it up, and then my bar is reset. That is quite important. Um, if you have it at a different height, your settings will not work. Okay, so I have now set this blade in the jig at the distance that will allow this blade to sit on this wheel at 25 degrees. I have a jug of water and I have the bath here. So I'm going to just fill up the bath to the line, to the full mark, and as soon as I turn the grinder on, it'll actually soak up this water pretty quickly. So I will just let that soak up the initial bit of water and then I'll top it up. You want to make sure that you always have water in the bath so that the wheel is constantly being wet. It will prevent the blade from overheating. It's a great way to sharpen. Okay. Now I'm just going to run this through. side to side steadily. Once you've done a little bit like that, you can take it off and just have a look. And I can see that it's cutting right at the bottom of the bevel and a little bit at the top. So I'm just going to clean this right up. Now you basically just do this until you are happy with the bevel that you've got. You don't want to go too far because you're just shortening the life of the tool. Uh, so I'm just going to do this for a couple more minutes. 
Okay, I did that for about another 30 seconds and it's just cleaned up that bell nicely and now I'm going to use the water stones to finish this blade off and then it'll be ready to go. Okay, the final bit of the bevel is using the two stones, the coarse stone and the fine stone. We're going to use both of those. I'm going to show you how to get a curved blade and then I'm going to show you how to resharpen the blade as well. The settings that I use on my Eclipse honing guide, um, for the coarse stone, I have the blade protruding out 35mm. This gives me a secondary bevel of 33 degrees. When I go up to use the fine stone, I will have it protruding out 33mm, and this will give me an angle of 35 degrees. This is the 800 grit stone. The blade's protruding out 35mm to give me an angle of 33 degrees. All I'm going to do is place it down. The blade, the blade end is currently very square and I'm just going to put some gentle finger pressure on it and drag it back to produce a wire edge. Shouldn't take long because it's been freshly ground. I can feel a wire edge there already. Once I feel a wire edge, I really don't need to go any further. I'm just increasing the size of the bevel by doing that. So that has a wire edge on it. But now what I'd like to do is just slightly curve this blade so I'm not get, getting ridges in my work when I'm planing. With these quarter of a mil strips of paper that have been laminated, I'm just going to place one down on the right hand side of the stone. And I'm going to concentrate my pressure, finger pressure, on the other side of the blade. And I'm just going to do a couple, maybe three. I'm just going to pop it over to the other side and do the same on the other side. Once you've done that, if you hold your blade up to the light and maybe just put the, the bulky end of a square along the top edge and hold it up to the light, you'll just be able to see the edges slightly falling away because you'll see a ray of light under there. That's as much camber as you need on that blade. That's perfect. So we've finished with the coarse stone. Now we're going to move on to the fine stone. So I've reset the blade in the honing guide to be 35 degrees. I've slurried up the stone, although it's drying out quite quickly. Just let me do a bit more. And I'm just going to give this a couple of passes, not too much pressure, just light finger pressure. I'm going to put some pressure out to the sides. that's enough. With the wire edge you will be able to feel it when you run your fingers along the back edge of the blade. It'll feel like a little steel hook that is there. Okay, now the final thing to do is just the ruler trick again. It's going to remove the wire edge and it's just going to polish up that back edge right where the bevel is. We'll do that every time. So I'm just going to, same, same thing, this one will catch slightly because of the wire edge. And you might even see it being left on the side of the stone. That's it, that blade is sharp.
slightly curved and ready to go. There's no more to it than that. Now what you find is when the blade becomes blunt, uh, all you need to do is to reproduce the wire edge on the coarse stone and then use the finishing stone to produce the micro bevel and that's it. It really doesn't take that long and once you've had four, five, sometimes six resharpens and it's taking you a while to get that wire edge on the coarse stone, you just give it a, a regrind, quick regrind in the Tormek. Now we come to resharpening of a blade. This blade here is one that I have used before and it's now blunt. I've sharpened this a couple of times since the last time I ground the bevel on the Tormek. So it, the bevel is still thin enough for me to use on the water stones. It's already got the curve in place. When I'm producing the wire edge on this coarse stone, I can either, once that's done, use the strips again, or I can just override this thin wheel and put some pressure on it and tilt it up myself. But first of all, let's just see how many strokes it's going to take us to get that wire edge back. Not yet. Five, six, seven. Just coming through. Might do two more. Eight, nine. It's just there. So now I'm going to do the same number of strokes with my pressure, finger pressure, towards the sides. Over to the other side. and check to see that you still have a slight curve. I'm quite confident that I have. Uh, I've kept the same pressure and done the same amount of strokes throughout the length of that blade there and I'm pretty confident that I've still got the curve. If you haven't got the curve then you can just place the thin strips back down the side and repeat the process that we did a while ago. So now I'm going to use the polishing stone to finish this off. So I'm just creating a slurry again on the fine polishing stone. I have changed the projection in the Eclipse Honing Guide to give me the 35 degrees and now as I already have a wire edge I'm just going to do three strokes with my pressure down. Move it to the side Start in the centre and then go to each side. And as you can see, resharpening, it does not take long. It takes only a few minutes. And now, once again, we'll just finish off with the ruler trip. We'll remove the wire edge and just polish up that back side right next to the bevel. And that's it, that blade is resharpened. You can see that it didn't take long at all. 
We have a razor sharp blade and a polished back that's ready to go. The next most important thing that we need to consider is the state of the chip breaker. I have two chip breakers here. One is the chip breaker that came with my new record number seven and the other one is a chip breaker that I bought recently from Lee Nielsen Toolworks. If we have a look at the chip breaker that came with the number seven, I'm going to zoom in and show you shortly the state of this chip breaker. It's not very flash. The chip breaker needs to fit very firmly and very snugly up at the end of the blade so that there is absolutely no chance that wood shavings can get caught between the chip breaker and the blade. They need to flow out very smoothly, otherwise it's going to be stop-start planing, taking the blade out, removing the chip breaker and constantly cleaning it up and clearing it, which we don't want. So we need to ensure that not only does the chip breaker fit very firmly down against the back end of the blade, but also that the top is nice and smooth so that the shavings can roll out. If you have a look down underneath when you hold it up to the light, there should be absolutely no light there. With this one, I can see plenty. Yeah, and that one is a bit of a mess. Okay, that is the mating surface on that chip breaker. That raggedy looking edge down here is the edge that is going to make contact with the back of the blade. It's in very poor shape. So we need to clean that up. We need to smooth it up and make sure that it's perfectly mated to the back of the blade. That's another reason why it's important to have the back of the blade flat. It's so that the chip breaker sits very snugly against it. That chip breaker there, this is the Lee Nielsen, and that is the mating surface up against the back of the blade. As you can see, that's in far better condition. When I hold that up against the back of the blade and look to see if I can see light, there is none. It's a, it's a lovely fit, and this chip breaker is the one that I've been using for about the last 12 months. Okay, that's basically how the chip breaker sits on the back of the blade. So as you can see, this is the area that we're concerned a bit along here, and it's really specifically only that front edge that needs to be mating perfectly with the back of the blade. So all I'm going to do is I've placed both of my thin strips that I use for preparing a curved blade. They're quarter of a mil thick each, so put together is half a mil. I'm just going to use them to tilt this front end, end down so that I'm concentrating purely on the front edge of this chip breaker and trying to polish that up and flatten it. I'm going to place it down on the water stone like that and I'm just going to run this backwards and forwards gently. By raising the pitch slightly it's a little bit like the ruler trick. have a look. I can see that that front edge is starting to polish. Okay you can see that front edge there is starting to polish. You can also see the jagged almost looks like cross-cut saw marks in the rest of that steel. But we're going to just try and get that front edge flat and polished. Okay, you can start to see that there. It's starting to clean it up. So already now, with just that small amount of polishing on the 800 grit coarse stone, if I put the, the chip breaker onto the blade and fix it down and hold it up to the light, already I am seeing no light. 
It's a very nice, snug, firm, tight fit on the back of the blade, just at that front edge of the chip breaker. So that chip breaker is working better already. I'm also going to just polish up this, this area here so that it's nice and smooth and that the shavings will flow very nicely. It's quite rough. I don't want them to catch on any loose bits of steel or anything like that. To help me get a nice finish on this surface here, I just have some metal polish which you can use to chrome up your car. I'm just going to place a little bit on the edge and I'm just going to use 40 steel wool to scrub that through. So just a bit on the edge and I'm just going to polish that up. It'll smooth it out very quickly. Take any loose scraps of steel and enable the shavings to flow off it very smoothly and cleanly. You might be able to see the improvement in that already. Have a look at the shine on that. Polishes it up very quickly. There's all sorts of books and articles that you can read on the preparation of chip breakers and they all tell you pretty much the same sorts of things. So the work that I did on preparing the chip breaker was pretty quick and easy and it's definitely not rocket science. If you put it all together and you find that things aren't working the way you expect them to, then just have a look. If you're getting shavings jammed, you'll know you've got a problem with the seating of your chip breaker to the back of your blade and you can take it out and fix it and have a go. Um, but right now we're going to move back over to the workbench and we're going to put the new blade in the jack plane, try it with the chip breaker and see how we go. Now we're going to set the blade and the chip breaker up, pop them in the jack plane and see how we go. I like to just pop the chip breaker on its side Slot, pop the screw in and just slide it down the back a long way away from the tip of the blade so that I can then just turn it around and ease it back up forward to the front of the blade. I really want to get as close as I can. I try to set it about half a mil away from the back of the blade. Tighten up the screw. nice and tight. Then I use the, the cap iron just to tighten that up as well. Okay, that looks nice. I hold the plane up at roughly a 45 like that. Slide the blade and chip breaker in very carefully. Make sure it's sitting on the lateral adjuster knob. There it is, just drops down nicely. Get it centred, pop the cap iron in and fix it down. I use a piece of white paper to help me set the blade. I wind it out so that it's protruding slightly. That enables me to balance it. Remember it's a slightly curved blade. So I can use the lateral adjuster to get it perfectly centred. Then I will wind it in, just watching how it falls away to the plane, into the sole of the plane. And making sure that it's centred. So I wind it right back into the plane because I want to finish having wound the blade out. I don't want to have wound it in and set it because when I take a shaving there's a danger it might just push that blade further in. I always like to set on the outwind. Okay, let's see how it, how it is taking a shaving. 
This is a nice piece of curly jarrah. So that's a very, very thin shaving. Nice thin through shaving. See that? So that's working beautifully. 